I stated emphatically that I uh, helped Thomas Hyde in his merciful suicide. I supplied the van, which was my personal van. I supplied the gas. I supplied the tubing and the mask and all the necessary equipment. I put the mask over on uh, Mr. Hyde's face. I turned on the gas on the main valve on the tank. I instructed him then if he was sure, then he, all he had to do was move his left forearm a bit and pull. He then pulled the string and the clip came off the tubing. He then went on and died. The 1990s saw their fair share of salacious crimes and gripping trials from O.J. Simpson to the Menendez brothers. Tucked into that decade was a series of trials that raised tough questions about the right to die. At the center of the conversation was a quirky pathologist from Michigan named Jack Kevorkian, a man who would earn the dubious moniker Dr. Death. Over the course of that decade, Kevorkian assisted over 130 sick and terminally ill patients in their requests to end their lives. By doing so, he challenged the courts, the legislature, and society as a whole to debate the issue of physician-assisted suicide and legal euthanasia. Kevorkian and his flamboyant defense attorney, Jeffrey Figer, became fixtures in the media as they battled through a series of trials in which they repeatedly defeated Michigan prosecutors who were dead set on putting Dr. Death behind bars. If you asked anybody in the United States, name famous people from the state of Michigan. Henry Ford invented the car. President Gerald Ford. Madonna. Bob Seeger. Kid Rock, and Dr. Death, Dr. Jack Kevorkian. The governor of Michigan in the 1990s, John Engler, saw that Michigan was in the headlines internationally every two weeks, courtesy of Dr. Kevorkian. Wasn't the kind of publicity that we wanted to get for the great state of Michigan. Jack Kevorkian was, by training, a pathologist. He was always sort of a renegade. He was always sort of a lone wolf. Very bright, very brilliant, quirky didn't really fit anybody's paradigm. Jack Kevorkian is a figure in the history of bioethics and every conversation that we have, particularly around end of life care and physician assisted suicide, maybe invokes him in one way or another. When Jack Kevorkian started his suicide crusade, it was intended to put this on the radar of the United States and of the world. He thought he was providing a much needed valuable service Society, the system, the courts, law enforcement looked at him as this, this guy's out of control, he must be stopped. And so it became for years this game of cat and mouse with Dr. Death a couple of steps ahead for years. We're gonna see if a jury, a jury of our peers will buy the prosecutor's argument that there was a secret unwritten crime. Jeffrey Figer, his attorney, for all his faults, all his fanboys, genuinely cared about Kevorkian. I would say he loved Kevorkian. Figer defended him for free. He gave him a house to live in. He wasn't just a client, and, and he wasn't just a friend. I, I loved him in, in the manner in which you could love Jack Kevorkian. He wasn't always easy to get along with. He was amazingly not just bright, but he was right. He was absolutely right. Dr. Jack Kevorkian made Jeff Figer. Jeff Figer made Dr. Kevorkian. When he spoke, he became very strident, and the way he would be portrayed invariably was that this man was a loose cannon. During the approximately 10 years that I represented him, I would say that I did about 90% of the speaking. I think it's significant, and I think it's uh, apropos that uh, Thomas Hyde died in a beautiful park setting uh, in Belle Isle. You will hear testimony, ladies and gentlemen, and evidence presented in this case that will persuade you that before August the 4th of last year, the defendant, Jack Kevorkian, did in fact know Thomas Hyde, a young man who was suffering from what's known as Lou Gehrig's disease. The Thomas Hyde trial was the first trial 
It was in Wayne County, Michigan, and it was much less of a circus than the other trials. And what will unfold during the course of this trial will show you that on the morning of August 4th, 1993, the defendant, Jack Kevorkian, picked up Thomas Hyde, and the purpose of that trip to Belle Isle was for Thomas Hyde to die. The world's attention is focused on what we are doing here. It's been said that there has been more attention placed in this trial than any trial that is presently pending or perhaps ever has pending in the world. You are charged with deciding in this case whether there has been a violation of Michigan law, which there hasn't been. But you are also deciding one of the great issues of human rights and the struggle for human rights and the struggle and the consideration of whether all humankind has the right and is permitted under law to make decisions as to how much suffering he or she must undergo before we finally, all of us, go into that good night. We have the tape because a picture sometimes does say a thousand words. Tom Hyde himself talks to each and every one of you now from the grave. Jack Kevorkian had been on law enforcement's radar long before he ever appeared as a defendant in a courtroom. When he first started his crusade back in the early 1990s, there was no law on the books that made physician-assisted suicide a crime. Kevorkian was repeatedly charged with murder, only to have those charges dismissed. In 1991, his medical license was revoked, and in 1992, the Michigan State Legislature passed a law banning physician-assisted suicide, a move that set the stage for Kevorkian's first trial in 1993, after he helped a 30-year-old ALS patient named Thomas Hyde end his life. Officer Banks, let me ask you to think back to last summer, specifically Wednesday, August the 4th of 1993. Can you tell us, please, were you uh, working that day as a Detroit police officer? Yes, I was. Can you tell the jury, please, during the course of your work that morning, did you ever see um, a Volkswagen van at all on Belle Isle? Yes, I did. The suicides early on were very strange. He would pick up the patient, he would assist them with their own suicide in his own rickety old Volkswagen bus, and then drive the bus somewhere or leave it where they did it parked and somebody would eventually find the patient who had died and trace it back to him. Pulling up to Riverbank and I saw the white van driving down Riverbank towards the bridge and I beckoned to my inspector to let him know that that was the van that I saw and I pulled the van over and <clears throat> Dr. Kevorkian was driving the van. Describe what you saw inside the van for us, inspector. I observed the uh, body of a white male with a uh, mask over his face, with a tube leading to a canister in a cardboard box. Thomas Hyde was one of the patients who I knew the best. He suffered from a uh, horrible disease, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. ALS is a disease of the uh, motor, primary motor control system. It's often called Lou Gehrig's disease. Lou Gehrig uh, hit 340 the next year he couldn't hit, took himself out of the lineup, and he was dead about a year and a half later. And what's the final result of ALS? It's uniformly fatal. One of the horrible things about Lou Gehrig's disease as it progresses is it ends your ability to swallow and you suffocate to death. But it does not affect your brain. So you are fully mentally aware of what's going on. That's a horrible, horrible way to go. Tom came home from work and it was about 1.30. It was a beautiful day and I'm thinking, wait a minute, you work in landscape, it's a beautiful day, it's 1.30, why are you here? And he was walking up our walk and he started crying. And he said, I couldn't hold my hammer today, Heidi. 
and he couldn't squeeze it in his hand. He couldn't tell his hand to squeeze the hammer. We left the hospital that day with recommendation for hospice. What was your understanding of what hospice was? It meant that Tom was going to die. <laughs> they couldn't do anything for him. We have the tape because a picture sometimes does say a thousand words. But Tom Hyde himself talked to you. And he talks to each and every one of you now from the grave. The videotapes were very important. Kevorkian knew that from the very beginning, and it was an essential part of our cases because it indicated to the jury that nobody was manipulating the patients. They were trying to portray Kevorkian as this, you know, m maniacal, megalomaniac person who was killing people, and against their will. The videos really put an end to that. So you had irrefutable evidence. First of all, has anyone that you know of, Heidi, anybody in this room, any relative of yours, ever tried to talk you into doing this? Um, Is it your choice entirely? Absolutely? Mine? Um, as I did. <laughs> The two criteria that people normally look towards when they want to think about the conditions under which physician-assisted suicide is ethical are situations where conditions are terminal, meaning people will not recover from them, or when they bring about severe pain. What we talk about less but probably should talk about more is the idea of loss of control, the idea of high levels of dependency that a person might experience as a result of their illness, and I think ALS has several of those different features. Do you think Tom wanted to commit suicide? No, I, I, I know he did not want it. It's not a thought. I know he did not want to commit suicide. Did he, did he commit suicide? Not in my eyes. What did he do? He ended his suffering. Did you ever feel that Dr. Kevorkian had ever done him any harm? <laughs> Dr. Kevorkian was the only person that was willing to help him. He was the only person that could help him. A lot of doctors have told me that when they have a terminally ill patient in bed and they have the controller of that morphine and they're told, if you're feeling pain, once, twice. If you hit that thing too many times, it's fatal. Now, is that physician-assisted suicide? There's a long-standing ethical precept called the doctrine of double effect and it's still part of the AMA Code of Ethics today. Under the theory of double effect, the intention is to relieve the pain and the latent consequence is, their, is the hastening of their death. And so long as that wasn't what was intended, then you're sort of on morally solid ground there, according to the AMA. He's a free spirit in the, trapped in this body. Tom is suffering so, and it's only a body. Right. His soul will be free. Right. What is your verdict as to the fact that you're not guilty of suicide assisting? Um, we, the jury, find the field defendant, Jack Kevorkian, not guilty of assisted suicide. There's very few people who wouldn't have said to themselves, if I was in that situation, I want Jack Kevorkian to be there for me. And what was the purpose of the meeting, Jack Kevorkian? The situation of my mother's suffering. Committing suicide? Yeah. Ending her suffering. Okay, by ending her life. Yeah, that would be the way. After defeating the Wayne County prosecutor in 1994, Dr. Jack Kevorkian and his lawyer, Jeffrey Figer, soon found themselves in court again. This time facing off against the Oakland County prosecutor's team with Richard Thompson at the helm. Kevorkian had violated the law again by assisting a widowed ALS patient named Marion Frederick in her suicide. This trial is not a debate on the merits or lack of merit of assisted suicide. If there's going to be a debate on that subject, it's got to include all the people of Michigan, not just the defendant, not just the prosecutor, and not even just you. 
in Oakland County. But I think the prosecutors were very brutish and they were not very effective. Jeffrey Figer, Kevorkian's lawyer, was extremely effective. Do you think that there's a law that could ever be passed, including this law, to make people suffer in a free society? No. This law doesn't outlaw assisted suicide. This law only outlaws somebody helping somebody else for having a bad hair day or saying, I'm just fed up with life. This law does not prohibit caring physicians, doctors, from helping people who are suffering and dying and who are mentally competent end their suffering in the only way possible. The defense of every case is about the patient and that the patient made their own decision. So Kevorkian could not have committed a crime and did not commit a crime because the patient ended their own lives. Dr. Kevorkian didn't do anything to them. Jeff Figer saved Kevorkian from the legal system many, many times. First, the patient is on my right, Marion Frederick, who has had a diagnosis of uh, uh, ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. And uh, to her right, it's her daughter, Carol. They would show the entire videotape of his consultations with these patients, where he would send them to their doctors. And in a lot of cases, doctors were not serious about pain management in the early 1990s. The doctors wouldn't give these people the time of day. And what was the purpose of the meeting, Jack Kevorkian? To discuss my mother's condition and our feelings a little bit. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, ma'am. And, and our feelings about it and just a general uh, feel for the situation. Okay, what situation was that? The situation of my mother's suffering and, and agony. Okay, and was to discuss the possibility of uh, your mother committing suicide? Um, of, of ending her life? Of, yeah, ending her suffering. Okay, by ending her life? Yeah, that would be the way. Okay. AMA certainly didn't want the country, our country, or the world to think that Jack Kevorkian was the face of end-of-life care in our society and that there were other ways of looking at this and dealing with this and handling it. This whole notion that we take for granted today of patients' rights, certainly of patient autonomy, our own personal right to define how we want to live and what is important to us, is really a, an invention of modern medicine and modern bioethics. Would you describe to the court and jury what any patient can do with regard to terminating the procedure? prior to the final possible complications? Yes, it's my, it's my unwavering policy to constantly question the, uh, the uh, patient and constantly, almost to the point of nagging, suggest that they, they not go on. That we not go on with what? Not go on with a procedure. Uh, I understand now that you are, uh, you, you consider your life, uh, quality of life quite bad, is that correct? This is yes, this is no. All right, what is yes? Show us yes again. That's yes, and what is no? That's no, okay. Uh, your mother uh, sent a letter to Dr. Kevorkian. Would you, for the record, please read what the letter says to Dr. Kevorkian? My dear doctor, I would like to establish contact with you because I see my options disappearing. I'm a 72-year-old widow who was diagnosed to have ALS. She has to lie down? Yes. There is a possibility that she could get a tracheotomy, but um, she didn't want that because she sees that as prolonging her life and prolonging her torture. She didn't want to feel like being a burden. I kind of felt like she'd lived her life and she was real comfortable with this decision. She was, even said this to me, that she, she raised five children that she was proud of and... Does anyone have any doubt about her, uh, the, 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 uh, the firmness of her decision? No. No. Have you ever desired that a patient die? Never. Within the framework of what you can make available to a patient. What's your desire? My desire is to aid this suffering human being as I would any suffering entity. There's a place in medicine for the alleviation of suffering even when it involves the end of life, like we do it for our animals. 
If you're intellectually honest, you can't say that it's beneficent, meaning that you're, you're showing kindness towards your pets and not provide that same beneficence to your fellow human beings. That was Kevorkian. When I wince at the suffering, I must do something. Even if I didn't wince as a physician, I must do something, despite any of my own philosophical ideas. My desire would be to see a patient pull the clip and then take off the mask. I actually instruct him to do that. Remember, you can take the mask off at the last instant. Even when you're getting drowsy, tear it off. They never do. They don't even think of doing it. It's hard to imagine, but it was a very beautiful time. Tell us, why? Because we knew she was getting what she really wanted. It was like our gift to her. It was an unselfish gift. And, uh, and we, could, we knew she was happy about her decision. Members of the jury, with regard to case number 931298-32FH, regarding Marion Frederick, what is your verdict? Not guilty. There will be silence in this courtroom. Everybody over the age of 50 knew someone who was kept alive physically long after they had an equality of life. And they showed those videotapes and there these people saying, I wanted to die, I, I couldn't stand my existence anymore, and that was it. No jury's gonna convict them after you look at that. You'll learn through the facts that Mr. Medelsky covered up a murder objection. when his Your brother objection. murdered his objection. wife on the objection. toilet. Objection, objection, Dr. Jack Kevorkian and his attorney Jeffrey Figer spent much of the 1990s in and out of courtrooms. They were fighting a never-ending barrage of criminal complaints in their quest to legitimize the concept of physician-assisted suicide in the U.S. In 1997, they were hauled into court again by the Ionia County prosecutor, this time for the death of a 54-year-old named Loretta Peabody, who was battling multiple sclerosis. I am the prosecutor, and as the prosecutor for this county, it is my job, my duty, my burden, to go forward and present evidence to you, which will show you what happened on August 30th of 1996 in the city of Ionia. Figer was a consummate master of psyching out the opposition. Figer had run around bashing this prosecutor, and the trial begins. And Figer points out the window and says, you know, I was wondering, what's that building? The young man says, well, sir, that's the Michigan State University Agricultural Extension Station. And if I, oh yes, isn't that where your mother was injected with pig semen so that you could be born? And he sits down with a petific smile. The prosecutor is apoplectic with rage and humiliation and fear. And he has to get up and do his opening argument. Now, when we talk about the burden of proof, you're gonna be asked to agree unanimously that I have proven beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the crimes of assisting in a suicide that he committed the crime of conspiracy to assist in a suicide, that he committed the crime of unauthorized practice, in other words, practicing medicine without a license, that he conspired to practice medicine without a license. This is a case in which normally people expect that in a criminal case such as this, that someone has gone to the police or the prosecutor and said, I've been the victim of a crime. I need the help of you. This is not such a case, and that is what's unique in all the Kevorkian cases. They are solely motivated and driven by the prosecutor's office himself. The Loretta Peabody case was a very interesting case. It was very different. She had been thought to have died of natural causes, and the cops raided a hotel room where Kevorkian was counseling another patient, got the videotape, and all of a sudden, here's this tape of Loretta Peabody. And a very young prosecutor in his early 30s, the judge was a brand new judge, and they had never seen anybody like Figer. It's almost a novel in itself. When you see you have a prosecutor who's taken the law into his own hands, who isn't acting by, for the people, but is acting against the citizens of this community who he's sworn to protect, and you're going to find out that in this relentless pursuit, Mr. Modelsky and Mr. Vogt realized they didn't have a case. 
because Loretta Peabody died of natural causes. And on her death certificate for the past year, it said she died of what's called medullary failure. Her brain was severely diseased with a disease called multiple sclerosis. Last Thursday, four days before the start of this trial, they altered the death certificate. Feiger has found out the young prosecutor was very close to the sheriff. When they found the existence of the Kevorkian tape, they just went and changed this woman's death certificate, which you can't do without, you know, proper legal authority. Now, you might ask yourself, how does a prosecutor get away with this? How do we protect Dr. Kevorkian? How do we protect this family? You, you're the jury. You're the conscience of this community. Obviously, people know me as the uh, lawyer, the trial lawyer for Dr. Kevorkian, but when the truth be told, I really was his protector. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Kevorkian has never in life intended anybody to commit suicide. So he must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Loretta Peabody committed suicide. She didn't. That Dr. Kevorkian did an act that no one saw and that he can't possibly prove. He, he, nobody can prove it. This case should never have been filed. What? is going on here. I'll tell you what's going on here. You'll learn through the facts that Mr. Medelsky covered up a murder objection. when his Your brother objection. murdered his objection. wife on the objection. toilet. Objection, objection, There were two thoughts I had. First of all, I knew that I was Jack's protector and I was his shield. And I had told him repeatedly, and it turned out I was right, that they would have to get through me to get him. And they never got through me. You'll see that Mr. Vogt wrote David Gorsica a letter and said, please, please keep these cases going against Dr. Objection, Kevorkian. Your Honor, that's not what, it, it, again, here we go again, a mischaracterization of the truth. That's not even close to the truth, and if it is the truth, it's not even relevant. Judge, I, I have the letter right here. You can, uh, you can actually read it. Mr. Volt can't claim that he's surprised by his own letter. Your Honor, we, Mr. Volt, we excuse the jury, please, Your Honor. We excuse the jury. Sure. In his opening argument, Feiger violates about 87 rules of what you're allowed to say, so the guy moves for a mistrial. Your Honor, with respect to the opening statement of defense counsel yesterday, it's our position that these have so tainted the ability of the people to get a fair trial and we are requesting that this court declare a mistrial. So they go into the judge's chambers, and he said to the judge, you know, if you don't declare a mistrial with prejudice so they can't bring this case again, I'm gonna ask for a special prosecutor to investigate woman's death certificate. And you know, judge, when you bring in a special prosecutor, they can investigate anything that goes on in this county. And the judge looks at him, and he looks at the prosecutor and said, Therefore, the prosecutor's request for mistrial is granted. That's really been a largely untold story. It was absolutely brilliant. What's a reasonable doubt? If it's not necessarily murder, and no one can define when it's not necessarily murder, that's more than reasonable doubt. By the time 1998 rolled around, Dr. Jack Kevorkian had become a household name and had earned a reputation for winning in the courtroom and engaging in increasingly bizarre antics, the last of which saw Kevorkian crossing the line between assisting in suicide to becoming an active participant. On September 17th, 1998, Kevorkian videotaped himself administering a lethal injection of drugs into Thomas Yauk a 52-year-old patient suffering from ALS. The procedure ended Yauk's life. Kevorkian called it euthanasia with informed consent, but Oakland County prosecutors called it murder. Judge, uh, we've had an opportunity to have certain conversations with Dr. Kevorkian with regard to whether or not he uh, is, wants to represent himself. He has indicated to counsel that he does want to represent himself in the trial in its entirety. During the trials, and I know Gallup was doing polls, he was the third most famous person in the world, not just in the United States. Jack was a little jealous that I was running for governor and people weren't paying as much attention to him. And we had made an agreement that he was not going to do anything goofy. 
when I was running for governor. And then he says, you're not going to represent me anymore. I know how to do it. Do you understand, sir, that you are charged with first degree murder? Yes. Do you understand, sir, that in terms of, of representing yourself, that this is a very formal proceeding and what sometimes looks very easy, looks easy on television and, and it looks easy to outsiders, is not at all easy? Yes. And do you understand that you may not disrupt or inconvenience the court? I'm here by uh, my own invitation. I act like the guest I am. And that means you will follow my orders and my procedures? As a guest. Well, it's more than a guest. You're here as a defendant, sir. But as a guest, propriety will be observed. Jack Kevorkian knew what a show was. He walked into court in Oakland County once in a stockade with his head and his arms sticking out. Another time he showed up to court with a powdered white wig on as Thomas Jefferson because he thought he was the victim of the legal system. And I'll accept your waiver. Brilliance and common sense don't necessarily go together. When I watched that trial, I watched a man who wanted to be convicted. I said, Dr. Vorkin, I think you're gonna end up in prison. And he said, I don't care, I have to raise the level of debate. We have to start talking about euthanasia. This is a murder trial. This is not an assisted suicide case. Tom Yauch didn't kill himself with Jack Kevorkian's help. Jack Kevorkian killed Tom Yauch by injecting him with drugs. You know, we wouldn't even know that Jack Kevorkian killed Tom Yauch at all, except for the fact that Jack Kevorkian videotaped the killing. He videotaped the killing and then he took it to the CBS network and he gave it to them. And they aired it on their program, 60 Minutes, in November to millions of people all over the country. In the case of Thomas Yuck, the last case that he did, Jack of Orkin came to me. He said, I've done euthanasia and I want the world to know about it. What's the best way for me to do that? And I said, you know what? I know Mike Wallace in 60 Minutes. This could never be a crime in any society which deems itself enlightened. You killed him. I did, but it could be manslaughter, not murder. It's yeah. not necessarily murder. So the question is, what was my intent? Was it to kill? This is the question. I don't know who else would know it but me, but evidently the prosecutor assumes he does. And he's going to ask you to infer that same thing from watching the film. On Thursday, uh, 16 September, and I'm going to have uh, Tom said he wants to go to Tom. Do you want to go ahead with this? Yeah. Shake your head yes if you want to go. That watching the film and watching the action going on and the result of the action, you deduce that was his intent to kill Thomas Yauch. I can assure you, I don't have such an intent. I don't intend to murder anybody. Okay, Tom, we're all set. We're gonna inject in your right arm. The debate about right to die doesn't begin with Jack Kevorkian. As early as 1975, you have a bioethicist and a moral philosopher named Jim Rachels, where he really convincingly argues that active voluntary euthanasia is not morally distinct from what was at the time called passive voluntary euthanasia. That giving someone a lethal dose of a medicine to end their life compassionately was no different than withdrawing ventilator support or feeding tubes and allowing them to die from a moral point of view. When Jack Kevorkian injected Thomas Yauch, he definitely took what he was doing to a new level. Whether he crossed the line then, I think he had been crossing some lines already. Mr. Yauk, the ALS patient, he actually uh, was enrolled with a hospice, a very good hospice. He chose, as some ALS patients do, to be tube fed, ventilated, and he got to the point where some ALS patients get where the only muscles he could move were his eyelids, he could blink and nothing else. And so he couldn't even push the button on Dr. Kevorkian's suicide machine, right? Being enrolled in hospice, he could have, or have his family, uh, call the hospice doctor, have him come to the home, medicate him for comfort, and turn off his ventilator. That's the route he could have gone. And the one thing I don't know is why he chose to call Dr. Kevorkian rather than his hospice doctor. The outcome would have been the same. Did Tom know that you were making, in effect, an example yes. of him? Yes. He did? Yes. 
And, and I sensed some reluctance in him. I, I did. Because he thought he was getting assisted suicide. That's right. And, and actually, this is better than assisted suicide. I explained that to him. It's better control. And I think that he got very wrapped up in the war that he felt like he was fighting. I think he, in some ways, became a victim of his own momentum in terms of his cause. I mean, he became quite zealous. And I think that that partly propelled him along. And those who say that Jack Kevorkian, and Dr. Death, is a fanatic... Zealot. The manner of death was uh, homicide, is that correct? That's correct, sir. Is homicide always murder? No, sir. When is it not murder? Well, objection, that's a legal question. It calls for a legal conclusion. I object. But he, 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 he answered it, so he knew that it's sometimes not murder. Part of the problem <coughs> we have here is the, the distinction between arguing law and arguing facts. And the law in Michigan is very clear about consent and euthanasia. And I know that you disagree with that. And I, I know that that's what you want to talk to the jury about. And I'm indicating to you that you can't do that because the argument of law goes to the court and then to the appellate courts. And the argument of facts, and only the argument of facts, goes to the jury. I know how to do this, that, and the other thing, because he was the master strategist. He decided he knew more than me, and he had seen me try cases for 10 years, so why did he need me anymore? He was going to get up and read quotations from Cicero and other classical philosophers. The judge said, you can't do that. He said, oh, I, you know, I rest my case. What's a reasonable doubt? If it's not necessarily murder, and no one can define when it's not necessarily murder, that's more than reasonable doubt. At least I think it is, and I think any reasonable person would think it is. When you can't even define when it's not necessarily murder, it's a murky situation. He approached the jury box and kind of harangued them, and when he was mad, he was kind of a fearsome figure, he stuck out his bony finger and said, do I look like a mass murderer to you? Well, yes, he sort of did in that moment. It doesn't make any difference that Tom Yelp gave his consent. And euthanasia, or so-called mercy killing, is not a justified kind of killing. Not in this state, not anywhere. And he's saying, now nah, let's have a decision. And we're not going to decide with all the people of this state. We're going to bring it into a courtroom. We're going to force this into a courtroom. And we're going to have 12 people decide it. It's not going to be voted on by all the people, like in a democracy. It's going to be decided by 12 people. Members of the jury, and remember, you've taken an oath to return a true and a just verdict based only on the evidence in my instructions on the law. You must not let sympathy or prejudice influence your decision. Members of the jury, it's my understanding from your note that you've reached a verdict. By all measures, Dr. Jack Kevorkian was a risk taker. He took risks when he assisted over 130 people in their suicides. He took risks when he videotaped himself injecting Thomas Yauch with a life-ending cocktail of drugs and then taking that videotape to the 60 Minutes news program. But defending himself in court might have been the biggest risk of all. There's an old adage, he who represents himself as a fool for a client. The question is, would that apply to Jack Kevorkian? May be seated. Jury has indicated that they've reached a verdict. Jury took some time, and the prosecutor said, if he please go to manslaughter, they'll be fine. And Kevorkian said, no! Members of the jury, it's my understanding from your note that you've reached a verdict? We have. With regard to count one, what is your verdict? Now, one is guilty of lesser charge of second-degree murder. And with regard to count two, what is your verdict? Guilty of delivery of a controlled substance. He had me for 10 years. He had me through six murder trials and untold other legal proceedings. It was just me. He can't be me. I'm quite certain I, I could have gotten him off again. This is a court of law, and 
You said that you invited yourself here to take a final stand. But this trial was not an opportunity for a referendum. The law prohibiting euthanasia was specifically reviewed and clarified by the Michigan Supreme Court several years ago in a decision involving your very own cases, sir. So the charge here should come as no surprise to you. You invited yourself to the wrong forum. And you had the audacity to go on national television, show the world what you did, and dare the legal system to stop you. Well, sir, consider yourself stopped. And considering the circumstances of this case, it will be the sentence of this court that you spend from 10 to 25 years with the Michigan Department of Corrections. The legislature tried several times to try to box him in and take him out of business, if you will. They eventually did. They passed a law which was second degree murder for a physician to assist in a suicide. That's ultimately what sent Jack Kevorkian into prison. We all knew he was going to be released early because he had his own terminal health issues. So he was granted a compassionate release early. We all wanted to be there when he was released from prison. When he walked out of prison, he got into one car. That was Mike Wallace in 60 minutes, while the rest of us just watched to go. Ultimate present day benefit of what Korvorkian and I did is hospice. It's changed significantly. In the old days, to get hospice was very hard, and they limited the amount of drugs that you got. Nowadays, because of Kevorkian, they've opened the floodgates. You can get as much morphine as you want, and you can go as quickly or as slowly as you want to go. The question of whether we would be where we are without the antics and the flamboyance of Jack Kevorkian is, is sort of a, the million dollar question. I think there's no doubt that what he did and the way he did it put it in the national spotlight in a way that it would not have been otherwise. But I think that there were plenty of people who agreed with him in principle and just weren't sure that, that he was going about it the best way. You know, I think that Jack Kevorkian was both the movement's best and worst messenger. I often thought that if Jack Kevorkian had dropped dead of a heart attack after his last victory in the Oakland County trials in 1996, his reputation would be much, much different than it ended up being. We still, as a people, are squeamish about death. We have never addressed death because we all know, of course, everybody else is gonna die, but not me. Or when I die, it's gonna be with my head on the pillow and the bluebird singing, probably not. Kevorkian, forced us to ask a lot of questions about death that we haven't really answered. His legacy is unquestionable. In 100 years, he will be remembered as a beneficent, wise physician who protected the inalienable right of patients to make decisions at the end of their life about their suffering. And, and I don't care if the medical profession as exists today would poo-poo that. It ain't true. You'll be forgotten in 100 years. He won't. After serving eight years in prison, Dr. Jack Kevorkian was released on June 1st, 2007. One of the conditions of his early parole was that he would not participate in any other suicides. This was an agreement that he honored. In 2008, he ran for Congress as an independent, gaining over 2% of the vote. But he died in 2011 of natural causes at the age of 83. I'm Ashley Banfield. Thanks for watching. <laughs>